So, uh, we're getting started today. We are um, in the book of 1 John, and every week we just start to look at verses and just kind of walk through them uh, so that we can try and get our mind around what's being talked about. Uh, so, we started in 1 John a couple weeks ago, and last week we started to chew on and look at uh, verses 5 through 10. So, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Um, we, we made it about halfway through those verses, uh, but today I want to go back, I want to read those again, and then I just want to recap the first uh, couple verses, just kind of chew on it just lightly, um, and then finish up with those verses, the rest of those verses today, hopefully. Um, so, if, who has a Bible would like to read uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-10? through 10? Who wants to read that for us? 5-10. through 10. What chapter? First John, First John, chapter one, verses five through ten. Thanks. Big sign up there. We need to put a whiteboard up here. I don't know if you can write on that one though. All right. So who wants to read that? This is the audience participation portion of today's lesson. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. We claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness. We lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We claim to be without sin. We, decide, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. There you go. All right. So, uh, just to kind of just frame this back again a little bit, and I, I, I don't want to ever lose sight of this part of this, is that uh, we're, we're reading something that uh, the Apostle John wrote. And when he, when he writes... Uh, he's somebody who, who walked with Jesus. Um, he, he, he heard him. Uh, he walked with him. He saw him do things. So when we read what he's saying here, it's, it's important to just keep in mind, hey, this is a first-hand account. So when he says uh, we're writing the things that we've heard, we're proclaiming the things that we've heard, as, especially like uh, 1 John uh, verses 1 through 4, he's given a first-hand account. Um, so as I've shared before that uh, for me when I read that, it makes me pay a little bit more attention, though. To, to I want to I want to hear what he's saying. I want to understand what he's saying because he he walked with Christ, um, and so it just for me, it's not that it carries more weight than anything else in the Bible, uh, but it, it really uh, for me just I just want to know more because he was there. Um, in some of the other letters we read, like you read a lot of things that Paul uh, wrote, he wasn't walking with Christ. He didn't spend every day with him of his ministry like John did. Uh, so to, for me, I, you know, when I read it, I'm like, oh, I, I want to hear what you have to say. So anyways, uh, in uh, verse 5, it says, This is the message that we've heard from him and declare to you. So again, that, there's that thought. John says, hey, I walked with him. And what I'm sharing with you is what he shared with me. Um, so this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. Now, this is going to be a main point we looked at last week. This is like John's main uh, thought here, and he's fixing to everything that he's fixing to talk about ties back into this verse. So he wants to make sure that everyone understands this is a fact, that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. So I just, just real quick, what's some thoughts on that? Does, do we have any thoughts? Does anybody remember anything from last week? Okay, so uh, what I want to point out real quick, uh, because I really do want to get to the second half of these verses. I don't want to regurgitate everything from last week. Um, but first thing is that God's light. 
Um, without light, uh, you think about it in a far, as far as a creation sense, um, nothing would exist on this earth without light. Everything is sustained on this earth because God is light. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing, um, when in reference to John writing that God is light, um, is he's is he reflects back to uh, the Gospel of John, where it says that Christ came uh, came into this uh, world as light. So let's look real quick. I don't want to miss this. Look at John chapter eight, verse twelve. John 8, 12. Yeah. So, John 8, 12. Somebody read that. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There you go. So, right there. So, and it's important to make those connections because uh, the Apostle John who walked with Christ, wrote the book of John that we read, the Gospel of John, um, and then he also wrote 1 John, and he's making these correlations. He's talking about that God's light, but he also talks about that Christ is light, and that Christ came into this world, and it's the same thought. Uh, in, as we read in 1 John, God is light, in him there's no darkness at all. In, in John chapter 8, uh, Christ came into this world, he's light, and whoever believes in him will not walk in darkness. Same exact thought, and he's talking about Christ. Uh, third thing is that when it talks about God as light, it's this idea of pure holiness, which we talked about last week and we really hit on, is that when it's talking about God as, as light, it's talking about that there's this pure holiness to who He is, a pure righteousness. In Him, there's no darkness. There's these complete opposite things. They have no correlation together. They cannot be intertwined. God is light, and in Him, there is no darkness at all. And so John wants to make sure that we understand this because of the things that he's fixing to talk about. So as we continue on, he says, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk, uh, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. So as John's talking, um, he says that, hey, if we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness that we're lying. And you got to understand, a couple things that are going on as he's writing this, is this, this idea of fellowship is this close uh, relationship. And he's saying that, hey, if it, and, and, and don't miss this, the, and, and I've talked about this before, that in the Greek, the, the, the verbs that are used, they're, they're, they add such specificity to what's being said. It really it, it highlights what's going on. And as he says, if we claim... That verb is, is written in the subjunctive <coughs> mood, which means that some people are going to do this. That this, there's a strong possibility that some people are going to be doing this. Okay? And so as you read it, and, and it's also in the tenses, it's a past, present, and future verb. So it means for, uh, like, for all time, past, present, and future, there's going to be people that believe this and do this. So, so that right there should make you think, like, okay, so I need to pay attention to what's going on because he's saying that for all time, this, this situation is going to happen. God is light. In him there's no darkness. And if we claim that we have fellowship with him but continue to, to walk in darkness, that we have no fellowship with him because the thing is just like God's light and he's this pure holiness and this pure righteousness that he has no uh, interaction with darkness. They can't coexist together at the same time. He says the same thing's true for us. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, but we choose to walk in darkness, that we're, 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 we've deceived ourselves, as He'll say later on. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, some people are going to do this, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Uh, in fact, what's happened, as we talked about last week also, is that we've redefined the truth. Because what's happened is that we, we, we redefine what what we define sin as. M most often, that's what's happened is that, that that there's a there's light and there's darkness, but we redefine what darkness really is. Um, and we're going to look at that more as we continue to walk through the rest of these verses. Um, any other thoughts there? Anybody have any thoughts? Anything from last week? Any new thoughts? The, uh, we talked about last week, too, that 
uh, if we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk um, and this idea of walking is this direction uh, in life. It's, a, it's you're walking this direction, you're, you're uh, living this lifestyle um, is what's being applied here. It's not just that you screwed up and that you did something you weren't supposed to. It's this idea of like you're continuing in your life, you're continuing to walk a path that has to do with darkness and you're sitting there thinking, I'm a Christian, I, I have this relationship with Christ, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing uh, and, and things are great and, and I have this, this wonderful relationship uh, when the reality is is that you're uh, mired in sin, you're covered in sin, um, you've redefined what sin is because you, you say, well, because uh, you know that in order to have a relationship with Christ, you know that you can't just be filled with sin. Um, so you sit there and you redefine what sin is. Well, my sin really isn't that bad. I'm really not doing this. Uh, this little thing right here isn't that big a deal. And, and this right here, everyone's okay with it. And, and this is okay. This, this isn't really that bad. You've redefined what sin is. You're living in darkness. You've deceived yourself because you think that you're walking in light. And John says, in the subjunct subjunctive mood, in the Greek verb, that some will do this. And it's written in the tense for past, present, and future because even right now in the present today, people are doing this. And in a hundred years, if Christ hasn't come back, people will be doing this. And 200 years ago, people did this. It's powerful. So, um, let's see. Uh, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light... We will have fellowship with one another, and the blood of, of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Um, as, he, as, he, as he speaks this, he says, uh, but if we walk, uh, and again, that's subjunctive because it's saying that there's some people who do this and some people who won't do this. Uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, he says a statement of fact is that we'll have fellowship with one another. Um, and we talked about that last week, that that's a proof of, um, of what it looks like to know that you're walking in the light, is that you do have fellowship with other believers. Um, it's not, the, it's not a, an extensive list that he gives us, um, but obviously as John's writing this, whatever's going on in, in society as he's writing it, has to do with there's definitely a lack of fellowship. Um, and what I was talking about last week when I brought this up, uh, was just that a lot of times um, what was going on with the church for them and that happens today is we get caught up in a academia. Um, we start to, we really process and want to just dive into uh, scripture and we get so into scripture and we're so about scripture um, that we really start to lack having fellowship in our lives. And there's got to be a balance where we are able to be around believers and have fellowship with believers and interact in the church body um, but then we also still hunger and thirst for scripture. Um, then he says, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Um, statement of fact, and, and uh, purifies us, uh, the blood of Christ purifies us. We talked about last week that the gospel message never gets old because Christ um, died for us. And, he, and as this is written here in, in, in this present tense, uh, purifies is that it, he keeps on purifying us. He keeps on uh, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. So that's pretty much where we uh, uh, wrapped up last week. Um, looking at everything, does anybody have any kind of thoughts? Is there anything that I'm not hitting on um, from last week that is pertinent? Or is there anything that comes to mind over all that? Yes, because I know this is what Brian would ask you. So even in here, it states have fellowship. How do you do that if you're not physically able to be here? Well, I mean, I think that uh, it's not so much about that you had to physically be there. I, I think that it's that, you know, spending the time having the conversations, having, you know, when you are here, being able to, to do things. But, you know, when, like he's out on the road. Hey, you know, there's still ways to build fellowship. And it's not, it doesn't always have to be just with, uh, the church body you have fellowship with other believers so, you know he's you know he's at a truck stop he's you know down the road or whatever there's different ways for him to still continue to have fellowship uh, with other people so um, anybody else any thoughts on that yeah um, I know we're kind of going through this kind of quick um, 
but it, it is just recapping what we looked at last week. But we don't want to miss these truths either, um, and and don't miss that. You know, as John's sitting here saying that that God is light, and in Him there's no darkness at all. Um, I would think that the point of fellowship is so that we're staying focused on not involved in our own little world, but we're breaking out of our world and we are in fellowship with others that are like believers so that we can do kingdom work. That's right. So um, as, as far as having fellowship like at a truck stop and stuff, I don't even feel like that would really meet, I mean, of course we need to of course we need to have conversations with other people, but I think more so doing 16. fellowship would be maybe uh, finding a group of men that's also on the road that maybe on Sundays y'all they could get on the radio and they could have fellowship with one another and maybe do Bible study together or uh, get into something, some type of ministry focused thing so that you're able to do fellowship because I may go to Walmart and run into someone and talk with somebody um, and I guess you could call that fellowship but that's not really connecting and living out your life with other fellow believers in order to further the kingdom work. Yeah, I mean, there def- definitely is different levels to fellowship, but fellowship can be as simple as just the commonality that, that comes from two believers being able to come together but and have far- conversation and can go as far as being able to do kingdom work. But as far as what this scripture is talking about, don't you think that it's leaning more towards something that goes a little bit deeper in living our lives in that fellowship versus just a Honest. an acquaintance that you're like an intentional like fellowship. an intentional fellowship. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I do think that it's point. I, I think what's happened here in this church is that they've completely alienated themselves to where they're only seeking after knowledge. Um, so, I. I feel like it does point to having this uh, ultimately a, a, a fellowship within the body where you're doing kingdom work but that has to start somewhere mm-hmm. and so I think that part of that path and getting to that point is that you have to have those opportunities just to be able to have just regular fellowship yeah. you know every time that I get together with uh, another believer I'm not it's not always like oh what are we doing for the kingdom you know it can't always be like that yeah. there has to be the time for just hey this is what's going on fellowship can even the way I heard it defined was uh, two fellas in the same ship uh, you know so so it, it's it's as simple it can be as simple as even just uh, you know hey this is what I'm this is what's going on with me you know but that would still have to be with like I guess I'm just trying to that would still be different than going and just seeing someone and saying hey once yeah, yeah. you know yeah. it, it would still be hanging out with someone that is in the same ship as you that uh, you're fellowshipping with regularly. Yeah. yeah. Well, but like for Brian, though, who's on the road, he might not see those people again. So for him, fellowship might be as simple, and what he might need to do is have opportunities to be able to have discussion or whatever, however he might be able to get plugged in with somebody, even though it might be for just a short time. So to stay encouraged, stay encouraged in the body, that type of stuff. Um, well, I want to I want to continue on and get into uh, um, verse number eight, and just kind of pick up on eight. Um, it says, "If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us." So I want to talk about. I want to throw it out there to you guys. What's he talking about? What's going on there? Anybody else have any thoughts? Anything else further there? What does it say in James? We deceive ourselves. Yep. There's one in James talking about we deceive ourselves. I'm so stuck on John, I can't get it out of my mind that <laughs> where he says right here that we deceive ourselves. James 1.22. Yes. 
Yeah. 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 122. Yeah. Yeah. 26. Yeah. So these guys are focusing on knowledge. Oh, that's don't good. think about it. You gotta just do it. Oh, great, great parallel. So, um, and and I have a friend uh, who tells me that living a homosexual lifestyle is not a sin, and the Bible never says it's a sin, and that the sin of Sodom was being inhospitable to strangers. So, well, I beg to differ. <laughs> and, and I don't want to alienate this person because she knows the truth. And I know she knows the truth. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, the Bible talks more about money and greed than it talks about homosexuality. And it's like, well, yes, but all of us struggle with money and greed. Not everybody struggles with homosexuality. And so they're kind of saying, oh, well, I'm not bad because I'm not as bad as that. Mm -hmm. well, what I'm doing is, is not talked about as much as this other thing. And so it's kind of we're deceiving ourselves by minimizing what we're doing because there's only like four verses that talk about that. Yeah, it talks about that. That's right. So, or, you know, you'll say, well, I'm not driving as fast as that person, so I won't get the ticket. <laughs> They'll get the ticket first. That's right. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Amy. I have another thing. I'll, I'll, the the I'll let that brother leave all the way down the interstate. <laughs> but yeah. am I still speeding? Yes, I'm still speeding. I'm still doing something that's against the law. That's right. Isn't that trivial? It's not, maybe it is the same thing. But we, we tell ourselves, I'm not as bad as that person. Yeah. I'm okay. 100%. That's 100% what we do. And, and, and I'm not. If the speed limit is 70 and I'm doing 71, I deserve that ticket. Those are, those are all really good thoughts. Um, one thing I just want to point out here, um, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Um, it's not simply that uh, if we claim to be without sin, it's not simply that we're just uh, telling a lie. It's more, it's the bigger point that if we don't realize that we have sin in our lives, that uh, that, that statement's impossible um, and that we you can't be a part of the truth and think that's a reality, um, because as you grow in your relationship with Christ, um, you're you'll be more aware of the sin that's in your life. Um, we talked about, I guess, that a little bit last week. Um, that as as you begin to uh, pour over the Word more and grow in your relationship with the Lord more, uh, you start to realize that things in your life are sin that you were never uh, bothered about before. Uh, you know that just happens as you grow. You just continue to be like, oh, I've, I've got to deal with this now. I've got to deal with this now. Um, you know, I, I meet a lot of people that uh, they become a Christian and all of a sudden they think, oh, I'm a Christian now, so that means I can't cuss anymore. And I'm a Christian now, so it uh, means I can't do this anymore. And I can't do this, and I can't do this, and I can't do this. Um, and they aren't necessarily feeling a conviction in their life over it. They're just going by what they think is a bunch of rules. Uh, well, you know, Christians, they can't do any of these things here. Uh, so that means I'm just going to stop doing all those things. Uh, and what happens to a lot of those people is they can't maintain all that because they're trying to follow a system of rules and not what's in their heart. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, anyways, I just say that to, to say uh, um, it, it, as you grow in your relationship with Christ, you begin to start feeling convicted about, man, I shouldn't be cussing. You know, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this because as I'm speaking these things, it's not honoring the Lord. As I'm doing this, it's not honoring the Lord. As I'm doing this, it's not honoring the Lord. Um, so as we grow in our relationship with Him, the Holy Spirit begins to convict us. Um, and that's just the natural process. So what He's saying here is that if we claim to be without sin, 
uh, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us because as we grow with him, we become more aware of the sin that we have in our lives. Um, so anyway, any other thoughts there? Yeah, I, I agree with that because I find myself like if I read, And there's times like when we do, when we are reading and we see things and we think, and like an instance will come to our mind, we'll think, oh man, I, I might have messed up there. And that is the Spirit convicting us, but that doesn't mean like in our life, like, uh, like oh, now I've got this other thing that I've got to have to do all the time. Uh, because if we make everything about to-dos and uh, like all this big old long list, and it's not the Lord leading us, then we're just going to get tired. You're going to get worn out, and it's going to make you want to give up because you, you just can't keep doing it you have, but like if the lord shows you something when you're reading you have to you do have to take you should take that in you should internalize and say man is he is he laying this on me so that i should start to uh really work on this in my life or is it just something like i'm convicted about this instance that happened because i know i didn't handle it right you know it's those type of things so it's like you read the whole chapter and there might be all kinds of stuff but that one thing jumps out not everything that's right that's right so, um, but that's but but that's the result of having a relationship with him. Is that as you have a relationship with him, uh, those things are going to come out and they're going to be shown to you, um, and you're going to realize that there's sin in your life. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Um, the the I, I just want to read this right here. It says, uh, uh, let's see, uh, it's just this idea of uh, of us being able to see uh, our actions, our words, or our attitudes as sin, um, which we had never seen before as we grow in our relationship with Him. Um, one of God's projects in the life of every growing Christian is to peel back more and more layers of our hidden sinfulness as we can as we can bear it okay because it's not all at once so that we start to see ourselves as we really are in God's sight so that we uh, so that we can oh I'm sorry uh, as we really are in God's sight uh, the glorious in purpose is that deep down we become cleaner and cleaner and become the people that he's created us to be um, so that's why he shows us the sin in our life because he's trying to mold us into the people that he wants us to become um, the danger, however, is that we resist the process of conviction and cleansing. We bucket, um, we, uh, we allow God to go so far, and then no further. Um, it's worth considering how we find ourselves reacting when God's light exposes some of the specific sins in our lives. It's easy to dodge the issue to look for escape routes, excusing, it, excusing things as just one little weakness. Um, excusing things as just one little weakness. Uh, that's a real danger. And that's where a lot of people find themselves today is that, you know, I'm willing to... Uh, I mean, if you think about the church overall, guys, I mean, seriously, the church overall, we're willing to, you know, say, I want to have this relationship with Christ. I, I'm willing to do this little here and... You know, if I have to change this a little here, I'm okay with that. But then when it comes to like bigger things or, more, or deeper things or, or things where it starts to really take away from what we want to do, then we're like, ah, you know, I don't know that I'm really okay with giving that up. I'm willing to let God go this far, but when it comes to this, I'm just not really sure. And I, if you hear me preach, like I'll, I, I like to talk about movies a lot. Uh, and to, to where people uh, give me a hard time about it, but I, I mean, in my life though, I've gone, uh, I've gone, um, and, and I, I've had conviction in my life where I've really changed the things that I watch. But I, I remember listening to this guy preach one time, and he was just talking, and he was preaching, and he was talking, and I mean, I'm just, I'm sitting there crying. And it was back when, uh, when I was working with the youth and teaching the youth here, and the the movie that had came out that was like just the big movie was a movie called Super Bad. And it was a super bad movie. Um, and it was just filled with just like, just, I mean, just uh, 
sex and and crudeness and just it was an awful movie and and I heard some youth that were in the in the youth group they were saying all these one line jokes to each other da 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 and I had no idea what they were talking about and I found out later that they were all from this movie and and then I'm hearing this guy and then so subsequent to that after that I hear this guy preaching this message about about just being a being fully committed to where the Lord's at and that you can't be where the Lord's at if you're choosing to be where he's not at and he's not in those movies and he's not in those things and he's not in that crudeness and he's not in all this sexuality and all these things that are going on and I mean it just made me cry and I, because all these youth were putting themselves in all these places where he wasn't at to where they had all these lines memorized and they were joking about it and thinking it was the best movie ever and the funnest thing ever and it just made me cry and, and I guess I just share all that because uh a lot of times we'll let God convict us to a certain point. You know what? I could probably give up some language. I could kind of watch what I say. or You know, I could, I could maybe stop getting drunk. I'll just drink some beer, but I won't get drunk anymore since I'm a Christian now. But then when it gets to a certain point, we're not willing to let him convict us anymore. We're not willing to go any further. Um, so that's, that's one of the dangers if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We deceive ourselves sometimes because we, we think that the sin that we have isn't really sin. Um, one of the questions I have just to throw out there for you, and this is just for you to chew on, um, is what sinful behaviors are in your life right now that you uh, might be dismissing? That you might be sitting there saying... I know this is a sin. I know this is something that the Lord wants me to work on. But I'm not willing to do it. And, because, and I'm not willing to do it because I excuse it saying, These aren't really, this really isn't that bad of a thing. Because He is light. In Him there's no darkness at all, John says in John 1, 5, 1 John 1, 5. And that's His thesis statement. His, his, the thing He's basing everything on and in order for us to have fellowship with Him, if we're walking in darkness, we're deceiving ourselves and what that fellowship looks like. So, and you gotta, you got to understand too, and what's also powerful about this is John doesn't hold back and what he believes is truth and this being truth. He doesn't, he doesn't hold back. He's, in other words, he's not concerned if this offends you and where you're at in your relationship with the Lord or, or lack thereof. He, because he wants to know, like, hey, I walk with this guy I heard him teach. I saw the kingdom walking on earth. I saw him resurrected. I touched him, but I, I saw him before he, he was crucified, and I saw him after he, he was resurrected. I touched him before. I touched him after. I heard what he said. I know that it's truth. I know it's reality. I know that he came to die for us. I know that he came to die so we could have a relationship with the King of Kings when we die. And you got to understand that God is light. In Him there's no darkness. So you're deceiving yourself if you're going to choose to walk around thinking you got relationship with Him, mired in sin, making excuses. You're deceiving yourself. <laughs> okay. I'll stop. Uh, but that's what He's saying. Don't miss that. Verse 9, though, uh, we have this, this great path forward. He says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to, to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I just want to say, this is a great verse to memorize. It's a great verse to hope. It's a great verse to look forward to because it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's one of the first verses that I ever memorized in the Bible. Um, a verse that a lot of people say, hey, go memorize this verse because it's a verse full of hope. It's, it's an assurance of salvation. It's an assurance of forgiveness of sin. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I want you to understand in, in this, I'm really big, and I've said this before, but I'm saying it again because there's some people in here that haven't heard me say it a whole bunch of times, but I'm really big on the Greek verbs because the Greek adds a lot of specificity to what's being said. There's a whole lot more uh, than what we just have in English. When you read this sentence right here, it says that, that God is faithful and just. That's a statement of fact. It's a continuing action for all time. God will never change who He is ever, period. And that's how it's written. 
this is how it is. God is faithful. He will never change. He is just. There will be a judgment one day. Period. These are things that will not change. It's written as a statement of fact. But if we confess our sins, confess, and then He will forgive us and purify us, those are subjunctive, which means there's a strong possibility that some people do this, but some people won't. Some people will choose to confess and be forgiven and cleansed, and some people will reject the idea of confessing and the idea of being forgiven and cleansed. Don't miss that. Some people will do this. Some people will choose not to. But it doesn't change. God is faithful. God is just. He's not changing. But for all of us, it's, if the ball's in our court, do you want to confess? Do you want to be clean, cleansed and uh, purified? Confession must take place so that right relationship can be restored. Confession must take place so that right relationship can be restored. I understand that when it's talking about confession, if you read here, and one of the things I love about walking through the Bible is you is that it teaches sound doctrine. It teaches you this is what the Bible says. This is we're looking at what the Bible teaches here. I'm not insert, I'm inserting a little bit of my opinion, but you you're able to, to look and see this is what the Bible's teaching right here. When, when you read through right here, it says if we confess our sins. Does it say if you confess your sins to a priest? Does it say if you confess your sins to another Christian? The, the assumption here is that, that a Christian confesses their sins to God. Now, I'm not here to bash any other type of religion, but th- th- there's other religions that believe that you're only able to uh, receive forgiveness of sin if you confess your sins to a, a priest. And then the priest says, well, in order for you to be forgiven, you need to say uh, 13 Hail Marys and 9 Our Fathers. And, and you'll see people walk around with rosary beads and they're counting out how many times do they have to say what they have to say. I have to say this many of, of this so that I can be right. And I, I'm, again, I'm not trying to bash it, but if you read what Scripture's teaching, the Christian confesses their sins to God and they're forgiven and made righteous, purified. So don't miss that. Um, uh, okay. Um, any other thoughts there on that? You know what I like about the first ten? One through five, you say, okay, this is my credentials. This is where I'm getting my info from. Fact check. The next one, he goes from darkness and light, and he, you know, the clean and uncleansed. But just right there, second verse again, I'm going to show you how to. How to how to fix that to go back to the first part. Oh, that's good. I love it. Yeah. Everybody tracking what she's saying? That's really good. You know, he does. He's like, bam, this is who I am. Bam. You know, and that's like, that's what gets me excited about getting to read what he's saying. And then he throws out like, this is what life looks like. This is what it's supposed to be. Stop deceiving yourself. And then like what she's saying, and this is how you're able to get back to that. I mean, it's great, 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 great stuff. Um, any other, any other uh, thoughts there? Okay, um, just kind of going on then. Um, and I should say this again because I don't want anybody to miss this. I, I, I think this is like like uh, important. God is faithful, and God is just. Because God's just, there there will be a judgment one day. There'll be a judgment that we all stand part of, if we've accepted Christ as King, or if we've rejected Him. So I just want to say that that's never, ever going to change, regardless of what anybody thinks, period. Um, Continuing on real quick, and then we'll get wrapped up. Uh, Verse 10. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Some thoughts there. Yeah, that's that's spot on. That is exactly what it's saying. If we say that we don't have sin, we're calling him a liar because we're saying what he said is sin isn't really sin. That's exactly what it's saying. We're calling him a liar because, oh, I know it says this in your word, but that's not true. 
I know this is what John's, John walked with you. He heard you teach. He's telling us what it says, what you, exactly what you said is what he's imparting to us. But I'm going to say, I'm going to call that lie. And by that, we call him a liar. That's a great thought. Uh, anything else? Uh, verse, verse 8, it says, the truth is not in us. And in verse 10, it says, his word is not in us. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the word. Amen. So he's not with us. Amen. He's just lying. He's That's right. Fair. That's right. 100%. And we're, we're fully just deceiving ourselves. We're, we've deceived ourselves into what we think this relationship is and what we think we have. We made up our own truth. 100%. Happens in the world all the way. All the and, and it's exactly right. I mean, that's why that's why it's so important to be able to walk through Scripture and to be able to chew on Scripture because it's, this is what's truth. And, and it's so easy to be able to take little bits of truth. Just like we talked about, there's this guy that we've talked about. I'm, I'm, I'm always going to bring up this guy because he's a great example in Oklahoma. Uh, yeah, I sit and talk with him, and, and there's, there's, I mean, there's, but there's so many church movements that are like, I'm going to believe this, 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 and they'll grab this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, to try and prove like, you know, this is the whole doctrine of their church, and they've grabbed all these verses everywhere. And this guy in Oklahoma, one of the, you know, he believed that if you had any sin in your life, you couldn't have a relationship with the Lord. Period. It's what he believed. And, and one of his proof texts, whenever I was sitting there talking with him, is he's saying in ver- uh, from verse 6 in here that if you have sin in your, if you, if you, um, he would say, if you claim you have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, you lie and don't live in the truth. And he would even continue in verse 7. If you walk in the life, uh, walk in the light, we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, uh, Jesus cleanses us and purifies us from all unrighteousness. That's what he believed. But then he wouldn't look at verse 8 that says, if we claim we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. So the whole doctrine of what his church believes, that if you have sin, you can't have relationship with the Lord, it says in verse 8 that if you say you have no sin, that you call yourself, that you deceived yourself. So anyway, just a, a great... Uh, illustration of how easily people can take little pieces of scripture and twist it to fit their point of view. And you just gotta you gotta look through all of it. Anything else verse ten? And they're just making it harder on themselves. hundred like, percent that guy is for sure making it hard. And one day he's he's made this list of rules like because he believes that you can't have any sin, he's got this big old long list that he's made like this is sin, this is sin, this is sin, this is sin. I can't do any of these things. He's and thirsty. so yeah, exactly. And, and in a year or two years' time, that guy, he's going to be so tired of training. He's like, I can't do this anymore. And then he's going to fall away. And so, there's no way. Because there's no way that we can make sure we don't do any of these sins. It's impossible to be sinless. So it, it's impossible to be sinless. The danger, though, is like I said a minute ago, is when you're convicted of sin, you say that's not sin. And you don't let the Lord work in your life. Um, several, several of the Bible verses or the translations say that his word is not in us, but there's a few of them that says his word has no place in our life. Yeah. It's full of the sin, there's no place for the Oh, no, that's good. It's that's place really good. His word does not live in us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Take, take up dwelling. Yeah. It doesn't habitate in us. That's right. That's, that's, that's the translation of our church. word does not habitate in us. Yeah, that's really good. That's real good. Um, the uh, when we say when we call God a liar and say that what He said is sin isn't sin, we deny the outward symptoms that confirm the existence of sin in our life. We deny the outward uh, symptoms that confirm that sin is in our lives. Um, and it happens all the time in our culture. Because we'll say that instead of calling adultery, adultery, we'll say, well, they just had an affair. And we'll say, well, instead of, uh, instead of saying that, hey, I'm being selfish and I'm being self-centered, we'll say, well, I'm just taking care of myself. I'm just making sure I'm taking care of I'm just going to watch out for myself. You know, just, you know, if you watch out for yourself, that isn't that bad. But if you're selfish and self-centered, you know, then you can see the sin in that. So it happens all the time in our, in our society. You just, just pick what it is, and there's an excuse or a way that we justify it. Um, we're able to look at sins, like some sins, and, and, and say, well, that's obviously a sin, like adultery, or you know, if you murder somebody, or if you steal something, or 
you know, if you lie, you know, it's, okay, those are all those are all things. It's easy to say those are sins, but it's a whole lot easier to justify things like greed, jealousy, envy, bitterness, having a critical spirit. And we don't look at ourselves and say, "Well, I'm being critical. I have a critical spirit towards you. I'm, I'm being critical of these people." You know, or you know, these people this, or we want to talk about these people like this, or be bitter, or fill with jealousy, or uh, envy, or be covetous towards somebody. Like, I, you know, I, I want what they have, and you know, we we don't look at any of those things and say, "Well, that's sin, that's sin, that's sin," and that sin's in my life, and that sin's in my life, and that sin's in my life. So we want to justify those things. James even says, "If we know what to do is good, and we don't do it." That's, that's, the same. that's right. Come on. That's good. Um, question just for you to chew on again is what sinful actions are in your life right now that you're denying? So a second ago we asked what was in your life that you're uh, I can't remember what word I used. Uh, dismissing. You're saying that's not really a sin but what things are we just straight denying? What things in our life that we're just denying is even a sin? Um, I just want to close with this thought and we're just going to wrap it up and everybody's already getting ready for church and not trying to just rush through this um, but whenever he calls whenever, whenever it says that if you, if you uh, don't acknowledge the sentence in your life that you're calling God a liar that, that statement is meant to shock us it's meant to shock us um, we deny his word and we deny uh, who he is and what he said. We're calling him a liar. And the reality is that when we do that, we're embracing the darkness. That's the reality. Um, if one has never seen themselves as a guilty sinner before a holy God and in desperate need of his forgiveness, then, then that person can never become a Christian. Every person has to realize that they do have sin in their life. And that before God that's pure light, that's righteous and holy, that in Him there's no darkness at all, a person has to realize that in front of Him that they do have sin in their life. And so I just want to share with everybody in here, most everybody knows it, but it's the grandest truth in the entire world is that God, He has a plan for us. For each one of us in this room, God has a plan for us. But that because we have sin in our life, we can't be a part of that plan that God has. Not like He wants. That sin separates us from Him. Because He's light and in Him there's no darkness at all. And, and, and every one of us, whether you want to admit it or not, when every one of us was a little kid at some point or another, we lied to get an extra cookie out of the cookie jar. And that lie, that one lie when you were four or five years old, I'm going to tell you, that separates you from God for forever. One lie, because in He's pure light. There's no darkness. He can't be around any darkness. It doesn't matter how bad you think the darkness is. He can't be around any darkness at all. And even if today you decide, hey, today I'm going to be perfect so that I can be in this light, it doesn't get rid of the sin that's already in your life. So at that point right there, you say, you know, man, for me, that, that sound, that's a bad spot to be in right there, that God has a plan, but because of sin, you can't be a part of God's plan. It doesn't matter if you're perfect from today forward. You've already screwed up. But the reality is, is that that's, this is where the great news comes in, and that God knew that we would all screw up. He knew we would all have sin in our life. So he sent Christ Jesus to the cross. Christ was an innocent and sinless man who walked this earth, and, and he died and sacrificed his life on the cross. And when he did that, he took the sin of the entire world, every sin that you would ever create, every sin that you'd ever think or do, and for me too, and for every one of us for all time. The Bible would say, for all time, past, present, and future statement of fact. Christ died on the cross for us. The Bible teaches that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that, this, that that's truth, that Christ came and that He died for you, that you have eternal life forever. It can never be taken from you. It doesn't matter if you continue to screw up. But the Bible would teach that, hey, even though if you do screw up, 
confess that so that you can continue to maintain right relationship with him. So I just want to share, that's the gospel. That's what John says. Hey, I walked with this guy. I heard what he said. I saw it with my own eyes. Don't miss that. And it's just you praying to him saying, hey, I believe this truth and I want to have a relationship with you forever. So let's close in prayer. I'm happy to talk with anybody more about that um, now or any time in the future. So but I just want to pray and close uh, and just thank God. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the truth of your word and we thank you for the Apostle John who says, I saw these things. I, I walk with Christ and I'm sharing with you what I saw and heard from him. Father, we, we thank you that God is light. In him there's no darkness and there's no shifting shadow. There's nothing that changes about him. That he is faithful and just to be who he says he'll be for all time, forever and ever. We thank you for that. And God, we pray that through your word and through your truth and through your Holy Spirit that you help us to become the men and women that you've called us and created us to be. And we experience the best life we could ever dare to hope, ask, or think. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.